Uh, greetings. Welcome to the webinar. This is Andy Jorgensen at the University of Toledo. Uh, we'll, uh, we're starting the webinar now. Please mute your phone if you have not done so already. There will be a chance for you to ask questions later on. The chat box will be in the lower right if you want to send a message to Jenny Brown, who is our host today. Uh, you see the title of the webinar today, Traditional Ecological Knowledge and Climate Change, Octaviana Trujillo from Northern Arizona. And um, we are I'm going to give a brief five-minute interview to our overall project, uh, and then you'll be able to hear the main part of the webinar. Uh, I'm doing this by PowerPoint. Uh, the National Council for Science and the Environment hosts the Encyclopedia of Earth and more recently the CAMEL portal on climate change education. And this is webinar number seven, introducing specific resources in uh, CAMEL. Uh, my name is Andy Jorgensen, a senior fellow with NCSC and in the Department of Chemistry at University of Toledo. The Encyclopedia of Earth, which NCSC has used for, oops, I just realized I have not was not sharing my desktop. Excuse me. I apologize. Sure. Uh, getting the technology straight here. Okay, you should be able to see my desktop now. Okay, Encyclopedia of Earth and the Camel Portal on Climate Change Education. Note our cute uh, logo on the lower right. NCSC has used the Encyclopedia of Earth, had it for about six years. Uh, it is a peer-reviewed online encyclopedia about uh, all sorts of environmental topics. It is freely available to the public, and it's wiki-based in the traditional format, but very different from Wikipedia in that it is peer-reviewed. Uh, Jeannie, could you, could you mute the lines, please? We're still getting a lot of noise. There are about 1,400 contributors and over 7,000 items, actually very close to 8,000 items. Videos, and articles and collections and ebooks, videos, and any registered user, and, and anyone can be a registered un user of the Encyclopedia of Earth, can post comments. There are portals in parallel to the Encyclopedia of Earth, which is a means to connect content to people. They are dynamic and customizable websites, and they can integrate, uh, this is the right power, integrate any of those uh, 7,000 plus articles from the EOE. Uh, you can create your own portal. Uh, Trinity is the software company behind it. And CAMEL is a specific portal on climate change education, which is the topic for today. On the CAMEL portal, we have almost 800 entries, uh, 500 of which are peer-reviewed articles from the Encyclopedia of Earth, and those are clearly marked, so you know what is peer-reviewed. But it also has uh, additional news links and websites, educational resources, almost 300 educational resources of syllabi, exercises, PowerPoints, and those are marked as resources so you can tell the difference. Uh, everything on CAMEL is accessible to everyone, fully open. After you join CAMEL, and if you haven't done so, I'll show you how to do it. It'll just take less than a minute. You can submit comments and questions on both CAMEL and the EOE. Uh, you can post, and we encourage you to post articles and videos and news and curriculum resources, and there's a template to make this easy. You can create your own website. Uh, we'll be happy to help you do that. And anything on your, that is on the EOE or the CAMEL can go into your website. Uh, you can, your website you can limit to only your students or colleagues if you like. Here are various partners, various universities and NGOs and government agencies that have been part of our project. We're now well into year three of this project, funded by the National Science Foundation. Okay, I'm going to go now to the website and give you just a very brief uh, road map of the site. The best place to start is in the center here. Uh, view a five minute introductory video, so you can see it as many times as you want. Uh, you can explore the topics of, uh, uh, of what's on CAMEL by step one here. This goes to a topic index of approximately 200 topics, subtopics, and sub subtopics. So it gives you an idea of what's here. Uh, you can join the CAMEL community if you've not done so. Clicking on step two, you'll, there's a key that will show up automatically. You put your name in, uh, create a password the usual way, and you'll automatically become a member. All right, there's no dues involved. There's no charge involved with this. And third, you can add a resource to CAMEL. Uh, there's various types of resources. Uh, PowerPoints and articles and other things which you can add. 
You see here, of course, the list of webinars, of which today's is the seventh. I'll click on it, and you can find other ones that will go on after uh, tomorrow. These are usually Tuesday afternoons. Today's is Monday, obviously, but then the next several Tuesdays we have additional webinars. Um, you can find material on here through uh, to uh, topic type, like reports and data sets, simulations, glossary videos or you can use the standard search feature to, to search any of the 800 items for the particular keyword that you like. Um, as you can see, our categorization is in four uh, dimensions, causes of climate change, consequences, solutions, and actions. There is a user survey that you can take if you like. Let me state at this point, since you're, you're on this call and since you registered for it, in the next day or two, you're going to get a very brief email. Uh, which would ask you to uh, give response to today's talk and give us feedback. We appreciate you responding to that and uh, letting us know what you think. As noted, uh, this is uh, funded by the National Science Foundation and one of our partners is the American Indian Higher Education Consortium, which is hosting this call. I'm now going to go back to uh, and turn this over to uh, Al, you want to uh, introduce yourself and uh, speak about your organization and our partnership? Yes, thank you. I'm Al Kushlikis, uh, STEM Program Coordinator for AHEC, the American Indian Higher Education Consortium. And I'm very pleased to sort of introduce this, uh, this webinar, at least very briefly, by mentioning that it's, a, it's a, an important, I think an important partnership between SAD, AHEC, and the tribal colleges basically intended to engage the tribal colleges in the, in the CAMEL project and in the CAMEL community. Not only by providing resources for tribal college faculty to incorporate materials on, found on, uh, uploaded to CAMEL, but also to have tribal college faculty and partners develop materials that can be shared with a wider CAMEL community. So Octaviana and Teresa's project focuses on a set of issues that are very important to tribal colleges and tribal communities, which is traditional ecological knowledge, and its use in supporting uh, uh, response and adaptation of climate change that has a traditional cultural basis. So I'm looking forward to hearing uh, Octaviana and um, Teresa's uh, presentation, and with that, I'll, I'll let you all move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Well, uh, This is Octaviana Trujillo. I'm a professor at Northern Arizona University. Um, I am very happy to have been part of a very important project for indigenous communities, for students, and uh, for everyone um, that is concerned about climate change. Uh, we approached this particular curriculum project with uh, many thoughts, many questions. Uh, we had to begin some very serious um, conversations about uh, what we wanted to share with others. Uh, we felt that we needed to include um, our scholars of traditional knowledge. Uh, we felt that um, climate justice uh, was an important factor for us uh, because global impacts of climate change uh, were very present uh, in our tribal communities, in particular Alaska and where we live here in the Southwest. Um, for Native scholars, um, we also wanted to provide um, important information um, within this process to really acknowledge that traditional knowledge is important for us as we work with our students, as we work with Native communities and non-Native communities, that traditional knowledge is um, very important uh, and one central um, aspect of how we are going to address climate change in particular um, in our communities, in our indigenous communities. And so 
as we work with our students, as we work with our colleagues, and certainly um, in particular uh, the work that we do with our students here at Northern Arizona University and uh, Tohono O'odham Community College, um, our students are primarily native. However, certainly here at NAU, uh, our courses are offered um, to all students, and of course we have um, quite a few students that are not native that are interested in uh, applied indigenous studies. And we included our colleagues um, here at NAU uh, that have training in political science, um, that have uh, worked for many, many decades in indigenous communities around uh, language revitalization. Um, but we also have elders that work right alongside with us, very similar to um, what occurs at Tohono O'odham Community College with elders, the scholars of traditional knowledge. So we encourage this interdisciplinary dialogue so that we could provide an important context for the curriculum project. The broad concerns, of course, are um, the equal and equitable input from these communities that are impacted the most, um, and how do we bring the elders, the scientists, poly, policy analysts, and students together uh, to recognize and validate each group's contribution, to recognize each group's equity since they are not the same. And we decided that for this particular project, because we could certainly develop a whole um, semester-long course on climate change and Native communities, we decided that water was very key, that we would focus on water, uh, that this would really be very central to uh, many of the concerns with tribal nations here um, in the Southwest and, of course, here in Arizona. So the focus and the common theme is water. Water gives life. Water can take life away. And, of course, water is essential to all food systems. So we also know that tribal nations really have an important role in providing tribal governance for and good tribal governance toward their natural resources. And so we wanted to look at current water policy and management to adopt to changes in water availability due to climate change impacts. And so if the questions were, who are the key actors? How much salience do these actors have? What is the best strategy for including indigenous knowledge and cultural traditions that respect the rights of nature in water policy? And so we wanted everyone to be part of the conversation, everyone to be part of the solution, you know, to really begin developing this climate change community of learners so that we could um, collectively identify those solutions. And so you can see that we have the elder knowledge of water, which includes the sacred history, ceremony cycle, uh, the traditional ecological knowledge of water, water policy, tribal law, state law, federal law, the science knowledge on climate change, the impacts of water due to temperature and precipitation, and how watersheds are impacted. But then we wanted also to really look at the future, at tomorrow, how can water policy incorporate both the scientific and traditional knowledge for sound policies um, as it relates to tribal nations and other uh, forms of government? And so adaptation plans incorporating both scientific and traditional knowledge and values 
was also very important to us as we had these conversations. Indigenous peoples all over the world, globally, uh, are talking about traditional knowledge. What is traditional knowledge? What is traditional ecological knowledge? And so UNESCO has uh, formed expert groups uh, that includes peoples from different parts of the world to collectively come up with a statement uh, that reflects what it means to indigenous peoples all over the world. Traditional ecological knowledge develops out of indigenous peoples' connections to land, homelands, lifeways, and practices. It's decades, centuries of observation, understanding, and relationships between indigenous peoples and the natural world, air, earth, fire, water, plants, and animals. We believe that both uh, Western science and traditional no knowledge are important in identifying solutions for climate change. And so one process is to really have those conversations. What is traditional knowledge? What is Western science? What do they share in common? What are those conversations that can lead um, to good solutions in addressing climate change? Vine Deloria Jr. Uh, was a very forward-thinking scholar. And these struggles between Western science and traditional knowledge has always been very much part of indigenous communities, especially when both are important and are valued. But the main difference between indigenous knowledge and Western science is that for us as indigenous people, for Indians, the knowledge is personal, and with that comes a responsibility. So indigenous people gather in different fora, and they talk about these perspectives on water. And these indigenous cultures recognize, honor, and respect water as sacred and that it sustains all life. There was a very special document that came out of the indigenous people, People's World Water Forum in Kyoto in 2003. And the statement, the very strong statement is, water is the blood of Mother Earth, the giver of life. So the Indigenous World Forum on Water and Peace uh, brought together Indigenous peoples and identified these areas that were very important to the collective body. Water is a living being. Humans and all living things have the right to water, but water also has rights. We are in concert with the need to give voice to the indigenous perspective of guardianship of all sources of water. And their collective statement, we as indigenous people understand this as our sacred duty to protect our relationship to all the elements that comprise life. This is Teresa Newberry from Tana Autumn Community College. I'm a faculty member there teaching natural resources and environmental science and biology. Uh, so for this part of the presentation, we're bringing in more of the Western science perspective and, and adding the element of uh, climate change into water. I mean, how is climate change going to affect water? Most of the time when we think of climate change, uh, most students, and this is, uh, I'll be presenting this as if I'm presenting it to students, uh, most students think of warming temperatures. However, they might not understand that global warming also uh, will create uh, huge imbalances in the hydrologic cycle, um, changes in precipitation patterns. 
and uh, more extreme events such as flooding and drought cycles. The other importance of uh, climate to water uh -huh. is that climate directly impacts the quantity of water available and it can affect water delivery and changes in how much, where, and in what form uh, the water falls, whether it's, for example, snow or rain, can have a huge impact on our uh, watershed and water availability. So when we're talking about policy, we need to include uh, climate change projections. And if we look at some of the precipitation predictions for the U.S., you can see this uh, red circle here in the southwest where it's an area that is going to be you know, hugely affected in terms of drought. We've already been seeing quite a bit of drought, and that is just uh, predicted to continue. And then looking at the role of Native Americans in land and water management in the southwest, here in Arizona, Native nations actually manage uh, almost 30% of the land in Arizona. So if you see here, um, just going over it with my mouth here, the red areas, those are the uh, tribal nations. Up here you have Navajo, and down here uh, in southeastern Arizona, that's uh, Tohono O'odham Nation. Okay, and so when we're talking about water in the southwest, Groundwater is a huge source of water, and so, of course, if you have a large land area that you're managing, you're also managing water. Uh, but it's different in terms of uh, tribal nations because they also have cultural ties to the landscape. They have a federal trust relationship in terms of their uh, land ownership, and they also have a widely variable capacity in terms of their ability to monitor their, uh, their water availability and also in terms of their policy and their, for example, adaptation plans. So for this project, we decided to focus on uh, the autumn and looking at their relationship to water and the traditional ecological knowledge that uh, is within this uh, rich and ancient culture. So uh, let's see here. So the Tonawatam Nation, as I had just pointed out uh, in the other map, it's in the southeastern Arizona. And here is the map. It has 11 districts. There are several non-contiguous portions. Here's the Santa Avir District. Here, but it occupies a large land area, 2.8 million acres. All right. The uh, Tonopton Nation lies within the Sonoran Desert, and here's a picture of, uh, of the saguaro, which is the uh, icon of the Sonoran Desert. If you see saguaros, you know that you're in the Sonoran Desert. Uh, it also has very many trees. Here is a picture of a Palo Verde. It's a leguminous tree, and it blooms bright yellow in the springtime. It's very beautiful. Uh, the climate is, uh, uh, the precipitation patterns are bimodal, having both winter and summer rains. And the Sonoran Desert differs from other, Sonoran, uh, other deserts in the southwest because it has uh, very mild winters. And looking at the rainfall patterns on the Tonantan Nation, uh, they vary quite a bit. Uh, on the western end, uh, it can be less than five inches. So here in this red area, it's very dry. They actually get more winter rains relative to summer rains. And as you move east, you're actually moving up in elevation, but you're actually receiving more monsoon moisture as you move east. So it can be up to say, uh, you know, 15 inches of rainfall. And it, at this map down here shows the biotic communities within the Sonoran Desert. And for example, here the deep gold color, that's the lower Colorado River subdivision. And that biotic community has fewer trees, it's more open, more creosote bushes. And then as you move higher in elevation, you actually can move into some semi-desert grassland here on the uh, eastern end because you're also going up in elevation, which of course increases precipitation. 
Okay. So a very important part of this project was bringing in the voice of the Tanatum elders. And I'm not able to show it on this uh, webcast, but I invite you to look at this uh, link here. This is a YouTube link, and there are actual interviews of two elders, um, Danny Lopez and Camila Lopez, and they speak about climate change on the nation. And they also speak about respecting the land in, in native ways. On this project, I was fortunate enough to work with an elder, Philip Miguel, who's also my colleague at Taunatum Community College, and we spoke about climate change and the autumn. And one of the things that he told me is that the autumn elders have always believed that um, the nature of the world is changed. It's a natural part of nature. So for example, in the early creation stories, animals, plants, and the elements like wind and rain all spoke the same language. But over time, that changed. And here, this picture here, this is Babakiri Peak, Waz uh, Iwok in autumn. And that's considered the center of the autumn universe. That is where Elder Brother, or Iitoi, lives. And Iitoi was the creator of the autumn. He is greatly revered. And he has also uh, brought the Himdug, which is the cultural ways, um, to the people. And since the focus of this uh, uh, module is water, I asked Philip about water. And he shared with me that water is very highly revered, and, but it is also feared because it not only is it a giver of life, but it can be a taker of life. And the ocean, even though we're in the desert here, the ocean features prevalently in the um, creation stories of the autumn. It's considered a deity. And in ancient stories, there was once a great flood, and Iitoi survived the great flood. And then from there, that's when the autumn people were created. So here's the autumn calendar. And this is a classic example of uh, traditional ecological knowledge. There's a lot of information in this calendar. In the middle, I should say, this is a man in the maze. So this is one of the cultural symbols of the autumn, which has many levels of meaning. And I'm not going to go into it in this lecture, but if you're interested, you can email me, and I can um, give you more information on that. Uh, but going back to the calendar, the autumn months actually reflect temperature and rainfall patterns as well as activity, activities of plants and animals. The autumn knew when to hunt. They knew when to gather foods. And they knew when the rains were coming. They knew when it would be cold. So for example, in December, uh, if you translate the autumn uh, word for December, it means dry, cold month. Uh, April, over here, this is yellow month. And yellow month is when the Palo Verdes are in bloom. So water plays a very central role in the autumn culture. In fact, uh, the, the coming of the monsoons marks the beginning of the new year for the autumn. They have ceremonies um, during that time of year to celebrate the coming of the rain. And just before the rains come is when the uh, um, saguaro, cacti, the, the fruits, the bahi dutch, are uh, harvested. And uh, there's a song that talks about how the red ripe fruit of the saguaro call to the clouds overhead to bring the rains. So again, a deep knowledge of the cycles of rainfall and the uh, timing of fruit, fruits and, and plants. Okay, so again, continuing on our theme of water, uh, looking at uh, the history of irrigation for the autumn. When we talk about the autumn, their history actually begins, well, it begins with the Iitoi, but then Hohokam are their ancestors. And in the uh, 600 to 1400 AD, uh, the Hohokam built huge canal systems uh, from the Gila River and Salt River. So this is in, the, in an area that is now Phoenix. Um, the canals are an engineering marvel. 
uh, even engineers uh, to this day take a look at the canals and and they see how you know the how straight they are the grade was just the right amount of grade to uh, transport water so it was really evidence of a lot of engineering skill as well as a complex socioeconomic structure so uh, coming down further south, here is a Hohokam Canal near Baba Kiwi Peak. So here's Baba Kiwi right here, and here's the canal coming straight across. And again, look how straight it is. So, and in more modern technology, the Autumn still built uh, canals, but they're smaller. Uh, here's the uh, small irrigation canal. All right. So there are three groups of Autumn. They're united based on their language, but they're differentiated based on their adaptations to water. So the Tohono Autumn people uh, live in uh, this area here, and they're the desert people. The Akamo Autumn are up north near the rivers. They're the river people. And the Hiachud, the sand people, live to the west. So looking at autumn adaptations to water, the Tohono Autumn had the two village adaptation. So in the summer times, they would uh, farm near washes and they would use a system of farming called uh, flood farming, which I'll show you in just a minute. They planted corn, beans, squash, cowpeas, and melons, all traditional crops. And they also, of course, harvested saguaro fruit. In the winter, they would move up into the mountains near the permanent springs. And here's a, a picture of farmers. And actually, this is more modern. They see they have tools here. Um, but here's a, you know, here are pictures of the um, plants. So again, these are traditional uh, plants that are adapted to the dry conditions. So again, that's a form of traditional ecological knowledge. The type of farming that they, the Tohono O'odham employ is the Akchin farming, which literally means flood farming. So they would plant their fields downstream from a wash and then allow the flood waters to irrigate, irrigate their crops. And also that water would bring a lot of nutrients too. So the Akamo O'odham, have the one village adaptation, and they would, you know, live near the the rivers here. So they had a year-round source of water. The Hiachud Autumn, the sand people, live in the extremely dry western area, and they actually did not have any villages. They lived a nomadic existence, and to them, water was even more sacred. In 1687, Father Kimo Kino came to the uh, Tana Autumn land, brought livestock, cattle, horses, construction instruments, uh, as well as winter crops. So it really changed uh, the use of water. And then in the 1930s, as part of the New Deal, the Civilian Conservation Corps built charcoals. So these are the deep catchment basements here to store water right in here. And that was actually another source of water year round. Groundwater is also used. It's managed by um, Tohono O'odham Utility Authority, TOUA. And then currently, uh, CAP, Central Arizona Project, is another source of water. And Central Arizona Project runs from the Colorado River, and it goes uh, east through Phoenix and down into Tucson. So uh, today, the Gila River community uses the CAP, and that was actually a result of a, it was a, the biggest uh, water settlement in U.S. history. And here we have a link to an article that describes that, as well as a, there's a video uh, talking about the importance of receiving that water to actually the health of the people, because now they could grow their traditional crops. Here, uh, Shuktok Farms. You uh, also uses CAP. Sanavir uses CAP. Okay. So this part here, uh, this, you know, for the students. Now we're going to bring in the Western science perspective, uh, and talking about changes in precipitation patterns. And for this webinar, I'm really going to skip through here. 
uh, because this information is pretty readily available um, in many areas, including the CAMEL site. So, uh, but basically, bottom line is uh, predictions are warmer temperatures, longer, hotter heat waves, uh, drier winter, spring. Um, if we have uh, changes in temperature, that increases evaporation rates, which is directly tied to water availability. And then another potential climate change impact is uh, the Colorado River Basin. And there is actually an excellent case study on CAMEL that talks about the Colorado River watershed. So I would highly recommend that uh, as an educational source. Uh, but ultimately, the important thing for the Tana Atom Nation and all the Atom people is that ultimately uh, the impacts of climate change will reduce the uh, water available through the CAP. Okay, this just shows um, Lake Powell, and you can actually see here, um, you know, reduced water levels there. Okay, so coming back to Tana Atom, impacts on ranchers. Uh, you know, the, the Tahana Atom Nation is just now studying the impacts of climate change. There's really not a lot of information uh, on it, but there is a lot of anecdotal information. And these are pictures of a charco near Pacinamo, which is actually west on the western end. And you can see this charco uh, used to, if you can see my mouse, where the trees are, that was the level of the charco in the past. But with uh, the drought, the charco is now reduced to this small area. And what happens is the cattle go to the charco to get a drink of water, and they actually get stuck in the mud. And this is a dead cow. And these are dead cows here. And here's a rancher um, pulling the dead cow away. So between the lack of water and lack of forage in the desert, the ranchers are really losing a lot of cattle. So that is a very huge uh, climate change impact. And then here's the written assignment. And here's where uh, I tell my students, OK, now you know about the traditional and modern uses of water on the Tana Atom Nation. And you've also learned about predicted climate change patterns. You know, what, what do you think will happen? So this is a small written assignment. Actually, if you're teaching, you can make it as large as you want. This could be a life work. <laughs> so it really depends on the timing of your class. Okay, so here I'll pass it over to uh, back to Octaviana. Thank you, Teresa. So for our students at NAU, and and, and certainly for the students at uh, Tahona Atom Community College, um, the role of water policy is is very critical in nation building, and so we wanted to again look at the model on incorporating the elders the traditional knowledge with the Western science, uh, the policy input toward solutions to meeting future water needs. And you can see that uh, we wanted to include all those categories that we had talked about before. We also wanted to have uh, group learning around the relative estimate of stakeholder influence over current and future water policy um, in, this, um, in this particular uh, uh, model. So with the individual projects, um, we wanted students to look at some of the material um, that is easily found online. Um, the stakeholder analysis of water policy. And as, uh, as Teresa indicated before, the Gila River Indian community um, recently, in recent history, had the largest um, um, water case in, the, in U.S. history. And so uh, there is a case study about the Gila River Indian community uh, around this water policy and what happened in particular to the Akimel uh, people. 
And so within this uh, case study, you identify the stakeholders and you use uh, this particular scale, figure two, uh, to answer those questions around traditional knowledge uh, with regards to the outcomes and where those indigenous values and perspectives on water are considered in the outcome in this particular case study. And as we think about uh, the future, you know, um, we want them to think about the status quo. Uh, we want them to uh, really reflect on their experience uh, in their home communities and their own knowledge base about um, traditional knowledge uh, as well as about water, who those actors are when, it, when we um, have those policy preferences and uh, what if we do not have any any data? And so uh, what we have as far as those models, those diagrams, helps us to really look at policy negotia negotiation space uh, for those resources and who are the actors and how are we going to develop good water policy for all, not just for indigenous peoples, but for all, because we're all human beings. The other area is the adaptation plan. You know, how can we use this, again, model for incorporating the elder, the science, and policy input uh, for adaptation uh, and for the future needs of, for example, Tohono O'odham uh, Nation. Tribal resolutions are very important in tribal governance and nation building. So we have some uh, templates around tribal resolutions to address climate change. So we want them to be able to, um, to, to really think about the development of those tribal resolutions. You know, we have had a very important collective uh, group process in coming up with uh, a resource that can be shared and that it is good to share. Um, so our colleagues here at NAU are Karen Jarrett Snyder, Michael Lerma, our elders are Bob Lomodovsky and uh, Marina Vasquez. I want to acknowledge uh, their work, their collective work and putting together uh, the materials for this presentation. Teresa is now okay, going yeah. to direct you to the climate change um, uh, website so that you can look at some of the resources that we have for you. So here is the, the front page for our module. And we had wanted to, and now my computer is, oh, there we go. Uh, especially point out the references and resources. So for example, here is the Gila River Indian Community Case Study. Uh, and here is a paper on the Gila River Indian Community Settlement. So these can be uh, resource uh, materials for the students for that project. Also, uh, there's a primer on Western water law and CAP because that is also important in understanding CAP uses and, and also the case study too. So resources for the adaptation plan. Here is a paper on adaptation planning for climate change. And for uh, the resolution, here is a sample tribal resolution. So these are all resources that the students can use uh, for their projects. Some of the other resources, we did include the uh, Indigenous Water Forum Statement and also uh, another World Water uh, uh, Forum Statement. So these can be useful for students to um, understand the Indigenous perspective on water. We kind of touched on that in the PowerPoint, but really didn't go into a lot of detail. And then down here, uh, starting with Overview of Federal Indian Policy, that is another um, resource on policy. And then down below here are uh, especially introduction to Indian nations in the U.S. and First Nations executive summary. We were thinking this, this course was taught uh, by someone with, you know, uh, at another institution who, who was not familiar with uh, tribal nations and the 
laws and governance related to tribal nations. It's just a little bit of uh, resource material. And this resource here, this is the article on, uh, it's a New York Times article on the uh, Gila River Indian Community and the CAP. And again, that has a wonderful video in it that I really encourage you to watch. And so with that, I will open it up for questions. Encourage you to uh, type your questions in the chat box. You can send it uh, to Jenny, who's the uh, on your list there at the top, and she'll relay that. Thank you for a great presentation. Uh, Thank you. Comprehensive and uh, but clear in terms of your points. And as you show here, you have this uh, key items on the CAMEL website for access to anyone and all those other resources they can download. I do see one question here that was uh, posted early on by Lyle Benko. It says, how does the main theme of climate change and the focus theme of water also integrate into the larger lens of education for sustainable be development and the United Nations decade on ESD 2005-2014 that considers global aboriginal perspectives? Uh, either of our presenters want to take on that question? Um, it's a very good question. You know, uh, there is a declaration, a UN declaration on the right on the the rights of indigenous peoples, and within that declaration, there are articles um, that speak directly to uh, those issues with regards to the environment. Uh, the UN Permanent Forum on indigenous issues um, meet, uh, there's a gathering every year in the spring in New York City, and you have uh, indigenous peoples globally that come and they caucus to bring uh, to the table uh, these important issues. And yes, there have been uh, certainly uh, a lot of working groups, expert groups, uh, that speak um, to um, the work that's being done um, globally with indigenous people. Ginny, have you received questions there that you want to pose? Good time to remind everyone you'll receive a survey about this. It's very brief. It takes you less than five minutes to fill out. We appreciate a reply back. Also remind you at this point that our next presentation is tomorrow afternoon at three, Tuesday afternoon. Um, Andy, we have several questions coming up on the chat line. Um, some were sent to me privately. Some are um, that everyone can view, but I will read uh, those that came to me. Are there examples of TEK and climate change in other tribal regions of the country? Yeah, this is Octaviana. Yes, what we are going to be doing uh, is including, we're going to be including some, some web links for uh, those resources. There are many agencies along with for example, the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals, they have a whole website that also provides um, a lot of resources around indigenous people, people and climate change. Um, and uh, so we will be doing that as well. I also want okay, to add on the, camel, oh, sorry, on the CAMEL website, there are several case studies. Uh, some from Alaska and some from the Northwest tribes. So there is some material on the CAMEL website. Okay, uh, another question. Have there been any cases or examples of how this indigenous knowledge per the eco ecosystems and questions where it has been applied in the local public policy? So specifically for Tana Awesome? 
Uh, I would say no, not at this time. The nation is in the process of creating uh, their own water policy, you know, um, nationwide. So it, it is incorporated in in their policy, but not uh, in terms of city of Tucson, state of Arizona, or national water policy. Do you believe that tribes will increase planning for water and climate changes through their governance structures? Um, this is Octavian. I believe so. They are already um, creating special uh, focused departments, uh, certainly here in with tribal nations in Arizona, because um, we, you know, water is going to be a big factor. Um, to sustain all communities. So yes, we see that happening. And again, we will put those uh, web links um, to take you to those uh, sites uh, where they can give you examples, they can give you a lot more material about what is happening in Indian country uh, around water policy. Okay, uh, this is a three-part question. What protocols did you have to use to work with the tribal elders? Were there sacred information, was there sacred information excluded from the teaching materials? And are the Te'ono Odom oral traditionalists? Are you, are the, I'm sorry, the, uh, it keeps skipping as, as we get new chat, it, it pops up on the screen. Um, are the Te'ono Odom oral traditionalists? That's a three-part question. Okay. What protocols did you have to use in working with the tribal elders? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, well, since the question is specifically for Ta'ono Odom, this is Teresa. I'll answer that part of it. Uh, well, the um, protocol uh, simply was you know, I'm Philip Miguel is a colleague of mine, and he's a, a instructor of history and culture. So, at the college, we're very uh, experienced in terms of, or you know, I should say, we've had long discussions about, you know, what we can share and what, and in what context, you know, we share the material. So, I actually, you know, I didn't have to. Um, have any protocol. I just basically went and talked to uh, Philip and asked him, explained the project, and he was very excited to be part of that. And then as an elder in Ton Autumn, I really uh, left it to his discretion uh, as, as to what was appropriate to share in this format. I would say all traditional ecological knowledge, and this is my perspective, is sacred. However, there are different levels of it, and I do know, for example, the creation story itself takes three days to tell. So we really very much brush the surface of that, and in this presentation, uh, focused on a lot of the practical uses of water, because that's very appropriate to share. This is Octaviana. Here at Northern Arizona University, the uh, elders are, are very much part of the work that we do in the Department of Applied Indigenous Studies. And obviously, you know, the material um, that they review um, and the work that we've done, I mean, if there is something um, that is not to be shared uh, with a greater audience, it's very clear to us, and, and that would never go up on a uh, public domain. So they are very much part of the work here that we do on a daily basis. Okay, do indigenous people speak with one voice? regarding water being sacred, or is there a more pluralistic attitude among the members of the tribal communities? Just looking at some of the documents that I have viewed, and I'm talking about indigenous peoples, uh, in the Southwest or even globally when they make statements about 
for example, water, it seems to me that there is a common thread about how water um, is what the world view is on water and 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 this is uh with just some of the declarations um that have been posted about these gatherings of indigenous peoples in different parts of the world so it seems to me that there's a common thread when as far as that indigenous world view toward water but obviously you know all tribal nations are unique uh, all tribal nations, you know, have their own uh, history, their own uh, ceremonies, their own religion. And I think that becomes uh, very, very clear uh, for those of us that are from indigenous communities and certainly for those of us that live here in Arizona where we have 22 tribal nations. Do you have examples of students conducting research into TEK in their own communities? Yes, we have examples of that. Uh, for example, uh, but we have not placed those on uh, this particular curriculum. Uh, there were elders and students that worked um, using traditional ecological knowledge with some of the work uh, that was happening um, with the Apache tribal nation in eastern Arizona. Um, and we hope that um, as we continue developing uh, teaching modules, there will be that kind of, of student activities um, that can be shared uh, more broadly. So yes, we have ha we have examples of those. And at Tonawatsum Community College, we we also have examples. For the most part, they remain within the courses that we teach. The students haven't published them or, or shared that information. But uh, we are having more and more students involved in research and, and documenting uh, traditional ecological knowledge. Uh, we also have several projects, ongoing projects, in which the students are doing community-based participatory research where they're looking at uh, climate change impacts on the nation, and also developing teaching modules for climate that include traditional ecological knowledge. Okay, we are almost out of time. Uh, we, I think we can take two more questions, and then we will um, uh, ask the presenters to, to answer the remaining questions by email. Uh, the next question, uh, do you have a sense of the perceptions on climate change impacts held by the people in, in the tribal communities? What are their perceptions? The, the perceptions are that they know climate change is happening. I mean, they've they've they they've seen that. They 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 talk about that. Indigenous people have always done adaptation for their survival um, and their persistence. And so, yes, they 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 certainly have. Um, uh, they are talking about it. They are documenting. Um, uh, what's happening in their community, and there's a whole process that is taking place in, in within indigenous communities um, to address those challenges. So, so we certainly have seen that it is happening um, again, and every tribal nation is going to um, address those challenges um, in in from their perspective, from from their own knowledge base. How did you get more rights to the water settlement since the Navajo and the Hopi is processing theirs? What methodology did they use? If you look at that Gila River Indian Community case study um, and the uh, supporting material by John Lewis, um, it, it really talks about why they were successful. But that litigation took decades, uh, absolutely decades, persistence in reaching a settlement. And um, but uh, in in that 
case study, and what we teach is is really looking at how how that can be done in a process that's going to be very important um, for um, tribal nations. Okay, we are out of time. We want to thank our presenters. Uh, Andy, I will turn it over to you for closing remarks. Thank you. This is Andy Jorgensen. Uh, we appreciate the presentation today. Uh, excellent coverage. Uh, very interesting and very specific. Well, I realize this, uh, a lot of this is on the web, as you saw the site uh, on the CAMEL. Uh, CAMEL, in fact, has a whole uh, resource category on indigenous people, so be sure to check that out. Uh, final reminders, uh, one, you'll get a survey. Uh, please reply quickly. That will be, uh, please reply at your earliest convenience. You'll get it very quickly. Uh, we have another talk tomorrow at 3 o'clock using NASA's Time Machine, an uh, interesting animation that students can, uh, within just a few seconds, uh, be looking at uh, climate uh, potential climate impacts. And then continuing uh, the, the next Tuesday, uh, next uh, several Tuesdays. Thank you all for your interest. If you've not become a member of CAMEL yet, we invite you to do so. Uh, no cost involved, no obligation, but it will allow you to post your comments on the modules, and this is one module you can post it on. Thanks to everyone for putting this together, and goodbye. Thank you.